Hello, good evening. I'm Melissa Idris. And I'm Sherrod Kutin. You're watching Consider This, the show where we want you to consider and then reconsider the news of the day. Today, Wednesday, the 18th of December, is International Migrants Day in Southeast Asia. There are about 11.6 million people who are migrant workers, 5.2 million of whom are women. Now, many countries, including ours, rely on migrant workers to fill critical labour shortages. But what do you think people think of migrant workers? Now, the International Labour Organization has released a report titled Public Attitudes Towards Migrant Workers in Japan, Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand, which attempts to answer this question. So let's take a look at two of the most interesting findings. Number one. 47% of respondents in Malaysia believe that migrant workers are a drain on the economy. And 83% believe that migration and crime are linked. What do you make of this, Sharad? Well, I think it's an old story of uh, misunderstanding about how the economy works. And mm. so people seem to think that, and you hear it all the time, and it's sometimes reflected in some of the popular tabloids, mm. that migrants are here and they're somehow taking away money. And, this, and so the remittance issue is often a big one, right? People are sending money home. This could have been money that was held here. Kept in the economy. But it only uh, kind of works if you don't understand how value is created in an economy, right? How do we get the wealth that we do? I mean, how are industries driven and, and how crucial are migrant workers, in fact, to the structure of our economy? And why has it uh, come to the point that we have millions of people working for us? Well, when I looked at this report, Shrad, you know, those two findings particularly struck me the most because I, I find these attitudes really suggest a fundamental view that migrant workers are, uh, should be treated uh, differently. It normalizes xenophobia. It norm normalizes discrimination and I think this is a real problem. These ideas not only devalue the work that migrant workers do, which you, as you pointed out, but also it, it exacerbates the, the bad living conditions that migrant workers are already facing. Yeah, so but there's also a question of fact, right? So let's just look at the question of the link between migrants and crime. And I think you know, many years ago, and this was addressed in Parliament, uh, were or are migrant workers or foreigners overrepresented in the crime statistics? And those years, many years ago, 15 years ago or so, uh, it was not. So migrants are not overrepresented. So, yes, there are criminal elements in the migrant population. Uh, and for some people, that's just one too many. Do you think? But they're not overrepresented. So it's a question of fact. Do you think the media has a role to play in this in hyper excuse me, hyper-sensationalizing um, news or crime related to foreign workers, yeah, migrant workers? That's absolutely. There's a, there's a tendency to kind of uh, uh, mention the identity of a criminal, the, the, you know, their national origins perhaps not as important to uh, the story as yes. perhaps the, actually what they did. <laughs> but, you know, it's part of the kind of populist thing, right? It's easy to blame other people for anything. So if you're going through hardship, if you're not getting a good wage, if you feel that you're not getting, you're getting a raw deal from the employer, it's easy to blame somebody else. The, mm. the reality is, if you take uh, foreign workers out of the equation in Malaysia, what would happen to our economy? If we just look around, how dependent are we? Sure. And would those jobs return to Malaysians? Would Malaysians get higher wages if foreigners would Matt, perhaps, and there's this issue around uh, how foreigners uh, are part of the equation for wage suppression, sure. right? You so know, all these need to be worked out. On that point, you know, because it is International Migrants Day, I was thinking about some of the questions when it comes to migrant workers. And here are a couple of things that we should consider tonight. These questions are, you know, that we should be considering the answers to how we view these questions. Um, should migrant workers have equal wages with nationals doing the same jobs? Well, okay, so that would be then this exactly would be exactly what a, you pointed out. Yeah, with race well, if if in fact uh, foreign workers did have those protections, it would not be it would be a reason to keep wages up, right? Because the fact that you know foreigners get lower wages might in fact drive wages down for Malaysians as well. There, there are complexities, and the issue sure. is the level of I think economic literacy, our understanding of the economy, I think plays a huge role in the way people think about uh, migrant workers. The other thing I want us to consider tonight is should migrant workers have access to free public services and the reason I thought about this was because um, it's the smart slung of buses will no longer be available for free 
for foreigners. Well, so there again, it's a good thing. Beginning 2020. It, it's how we imagine the city, right? So in the city, if we want our cities to work better, then surely everybody who works in it, who works, operates it, ought to have uh, efficient means of transport. Sure. If we are saying now, but because they're non-citizens, we want to deny them that, then we're going to create a backlog. And we're going to create problems for ourselves because we want to, uh, you know, uh, deny non-citizens a right to access to transport. Cities don't work on the basis of, you know, citizenship. They but work on the basis of who lives there. But it's not just cities, so to interrupt you, it's not just cities, right? It's also, and it's not just transport, but it's also access to healthcare, which is something we're going to come back to when we discuss the uh, recent polio case in Sabah. But for now, I'd like to focus on uh, Lembah Pantai MP Fami Fazil has, uh, has presented a report Port card on his first year achievements. Now he's claiming he's the first MP to do so. This report card, he in this report card he outlined ten achievements he's made since winning the seat in May last year. What do you think, Sharad, about this practice of elected representatives? issuing their report card. Well, okay, so the report <laughs> card metaphor is a curious one because, you know, often the student doesn't uh, get the report card. The report is given uh, <laughs> exactly. to by the teacher <laughs> to assess the MP. So uh, who would be the teacher in this uh, uh, story? The I think it would Prime be the... Prime Minister? The, Potentially yes. the prime minister, the party, whatever it is. But what I do or think, the voters, the perhaps. Voters, I think it's a, oh, it's a, it can be a very successful way of communicating the idea of performance, right? Mm -hmm. So we think of report cards and performance, and MPs want to uh, shout out their achievements, but. The issue is they're doing it on their own behalf. So the, que the question again is: Is their own assessment or their assessment <laughs> of themselves an honest one, or an accurate one, or an adequate one? Right. I'm a bit split with this. Now, I, I absolutely agree with you. I think you know it's a good way to communicate what they've achieved so far, and I think it helps to go in solving Pakatan Harapan's communication problem, the lack of communication they've had this year. It's been atrocious. So perhaps this is one way to go about uh, you know. Communicating communicating all their achievements. However, I worry whether this could lead to, you know, encourage kind of populist, easy, low-hanging fruit measures where politicians do. Because what's really important is the structural reform, the institutional reform, which may not be as sexy on an infographic. Or uh, actually, uh, uh, you know, lend itself to being able to be communicated, right, on an infographic. Exactly. So one of the things that Fami Fazil points out to is a hundred micro libraries. I really love the idea. I don't know what it is. I guess it's a small library. Is it a bookshelf? Uh, it could be a bookshelf <laughs> sure somewhere. More than that. And that's what we need to find out. And that's where the media comes it because the media needs to go down to the ground and look at these things and say, well, okay, maybe a hundred. How effective are they? Mm. What are they creating? Good things, bad things, unintended consequences from these initiatives. And that's how we, we get somewhere closer to an adequate uh, assessment of somebody's performance. Do you want to see more report cards come out from I other I think so. I think, why not? Because it ups the ante on all the politicians uh, across the board. Let them actually focus on convincing us they're actually performing and they're, you know, they're doing that. We're getting banged for our buck because we're <laughs> paying them, yes. aren't we? All right. Uh, we'll come back after this and take a closer look at that re-emergence of polio in Sabah. Make sure you stay tuned to consider this.